Hello, and welcome to the Radiant Mission Podcast. My name is Rebecca Toomey, and we are on a mission to encourage and inspire you as you're navigating through this life and with your relationship with Christ. We are currently in a series called God's Design for Birth, and today we have a very special guest who's an expert on birth. Audrey Ross is a wife, a mother, and a birth keeper who is passionate about teaching women to trust physiological birth and all about giving birth outside of the medical paradigm. You can find her on Instagram at a joyful birth or on her website, www.ajoyfulbirth.org. Audrey, thank you so much for being with me today. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for asking me to be on. I'm obsessed with your Instagram page. I, every single post, every single moment that you post, I'm like, yes, yes, more, 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 more. So (laughs) that is how we came together is because I just love your perspective where we have the same train of thought and in some ways, similar ish kind of experiences. You and I were chatting before we started recording about kind of your background with birth. We didn't grow up the same way necessarily. So I'd love for you to just kind of start by taking us through your history and how you grew up with birth and then how that transpired into your first experience and subsequent. So tell us a little bit more about your passion here. I would love to. And I love that you love my Instagram. That makes me so happy. I have so much fun with it, honestly. It's the best. It really is. And you come up with amazing videos too, where you pick the little things. So there was one earlier that was like random videos, but compared to birth experiences, like the, <laughs> the breech baby and the scooping of the placenta, I was dying. I, you have a skill. You definitely I'm have a so, skill. I'm so glad. It's been this beautiful channel for my like dry, sarcastic humor that typically only stays with like close friends or my husband. And it's been like this outlet for it, which has just been fantastic. And I've combined it with birth. So it's been so fun for me. Yeah. I love it. Awesome. Um, so I grew up in a big family and my mom was a doula as I was growing up. So um, probably in my, I, I would say like maybe eight, nine years old, she started going through her schooling for it. And okay. so we were very much a part of that, right? Like that was a normal conversation as she's going through her classes. And then as she starts attending births and about a few years after that, my sister became became a midwife. So she's going through all of her midwifery training and she was training to be a, a licensed midwife. So, um, a more medical practice than what I do, but okay. birth just became this common conversation around the table. Um, I had sisters who are much older than me, 12, 10 and six years older than me. So they then were birthing their own children while I was still in my teen years. And so okay. it was just normal to talk about birth. In fact, even before my mom became a doula, she was very interested in birth. She'd given birth vaginally to all of her children. Now, not it, they, most of them had been in the hospital, um, but okay. less medical than births today, but still sure. there had been medical aspects to it. Um, and how many kids she, did your mom have? Seven kids. Seven births. Okay. Yeah. I'm a twin. Well, six births. So I'm a twin <gasps> and I have a twin brother. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And well, I mean, both of you were born. Right. Exactly. You're, you're right. <laughs> right. You're right. You did have a- six pregnancy, seven <laughs> births. And, That's awesome. um, and even before she started training to be a doula, her library was full of birth books. So as a child, yeah. I remember sitting in her bedroom and like looking through these books of women giving birth, they're like black and white photos. They're, they're like, and, and still, even then that, you know, women sometimes are like legs were up kind of in stirrups. Um, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. still I was so fascinated with birth, even at that young age um I liked I liked to go in her room and like look through these books and I probably wasn't I wasn't reading them I just was kind of looking through at the pictures yeah um and so when I went to give birth so I was married for like nine years before my husband and I actually got pregnant and that was kind of like we didn't even think that would happen but it did happen and um my first birth I was decided to work with midwives and at 36 weeks they found out that my baby girl was breached now that didn't phase me because my mom had had four bre- vaginal breech births. In fact, myself and my twin brother were both breech and Amazing. then the oldest, youngest. Yeah. And my sisters had all had breech babies up to that point. And so it was like, what? Like we just give birth. We have breech babies. Like that's what we do. And so yeah. I was shocked. I literally, I was so shocked when they dropped me. Like I, I hadn't, I hadn't even think to thought to like ask about that ahead of time. 
Mm -hmm. I was like, what? Like, how is this not normal? This is normal in my family. And so what ended up happening is that I went to the hospital and I declined literally everything. And I signed the AMA. I refused to put on their gown. I refused to let them put in an IV. I mean, they, you know, strapped things on my belly and I took them off and left the premises. Like I, <laughs> I anything Amazing. they told me. Yeah. And I gave birth vaginally um, and in the hospital. And it was like a big to do. And I had people coming in afterwards and saying like, I can't believe you did that. And um, they made me <laughs> push in the OR. So there's 18 people in the room ready to like cut me open. And it's very Oh traumatic. my gosh, what? They had you go to the OR to push. Yep. Yep. They, I labored in the labor room, but then they're like, you can't push until we, until you go into the operating room. And, um, oh my, what talk and, about, and, and, okay. So talk about people that don't trust birth. Oh my goodness. Yes. Right. Like yeah. the opposite and literally 18. I mean, my mom counted 18 people. They're all dressed up in their blue, you know, garb. I'm, I'm literally on like this, the, the off metal slat, right. It's not made for like <laughs> pushing out a baby. And I remember yelling at this young male nurse, like standing there, like, hold my leg, because like, I didn't have, I didn't have anything to push against. So he like, he's ready, he's ready to like do surgery, but I'm like telling him to, you know, <laughs> nurse. anyways, um, she came out very, very, she shot you the conium shake- all over like everybody. Cause oh my gosh. what you must have shaken their whole entire world I did. with this. Yes. I heard stories like coming out of the hospital with, you know, chiropractors I knew and other people I knew from the, from my birth, it really, it was kind of a shaking thing that, that this awesome. had happened. Yeah. Um, and it was so normal. It was so normal. You now, guys so are, many- you're, you're like, get away from me. You, what, I don't know what's up with you people, but just back off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it was, it, it, it happened just, just fine. Yeah. There wasn't a problem right. in the world. Except that they yeah. shot me up with the person without asking afterwards. Um, oh, and- that was, that was the one, that was the one thing that really was hard and that I had to come to grips with actually years later. I didn't even understand the effects of Chosen until years later. Um, wow. But I did, that- did, how did it impact you? Do you feel? I didn't remember anything from when they shot me up with Pitocin until like hours later, in fact, like late that night, like she was born at it was probably like five hours, four or five hours later, I finally was in our room for the night and I finally, like, then I remember what happened. I have pictures so I can look at the pictures and be like, oh yeah, that was me. But I don't like, I don't remember eating my meal. I don't remember. Like wow. we took pictures of like my mom and my midwife who she like came to support me and my husband. Like, I don't remember any of that. I know they like weighed her and measured her. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't remember any of it. It just, it's like blank. So they totally destroyed that first hour of oh my attachment. Gosh. And Pitocin does that. It, it cuts off your oxytocin. Mm-hmm. And you're, it blocks it, right? Because it's a, it's mm-hmm. synthetic. It's not oxytocin. So you don't have oxytocin anymore. And so that that severs the bonding. And So this um, is actually a good uh, learning moment for us to talk about, I feel. Yeah, you know, you yeah. just shared a little bit about the difference between the oxytocin that our bodies produce when we are in the natural birth process because God designed our bodies to release that oxytocin. Yeah. versus synthetic which don't they make this synthetic oxytocin from pigs or something to that effect well, or... that, um not oxytocin that's like the cervidil that they okay. that's right will... cervidil but i was confusing it, it. so then this is but this is oxytocin... what some man-made chemical yep yep and it, and it doesn't function like oxytocin at all right mm-hmm. oxytocin mm-hmm. is a bonding hormone it's coming from a you know, from our brain through our pituitary. Um, and it's what does all the work in labor. Like, so your entire uterus is flooded with oxytocin. Your placenta is flooded, the cord, the baby. I mean, the baby is just like saturated in oxytocin in an undisturbed birth, which is why it's so important for a mom to go skin to skin because there's this transfer of smells and maybe even tastes like if you're kissing your baby and that is like, that is activating the baby's oxytocin and your oxytocin and it's what's causing your uterus to clamp down. It's doing all of the magic of birth. But the mm-hmm. moment you introduce Pitocin, Oxy, uh, oxytocin is completely blocked. So now we don't have a functioning birth, right? Now we don't yeah. have a uterus that cleans down the way that it should. Now mm-hmm. we don't have bonding that happens the way that it should. It completely severs that. 
And so mm-hmm. women will describe it as feeling cold or, you know, they don't remember things. Um, yeah. And, and that's, and that, I had that feeling too. Like I even remember my leg feeling cold. They just shot it in my thigh, like with an injection without, without asking, like, like we're going to do this and did it right. Wow. And didn't ask at all. Um, and wow. pulled my placenta. Out. So, um, oh they didn't have to, gosh. Do anything, but that was that. And I was, that was one part I was not prepared for. I was prepared. I knew about all the cascade of interventions. I was prepared to say no to everything else. I knew you never want an IV port in your arm already. I knew all of that, but I didn't know about the third stage of labor and what they were going to do. So, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I just don't have a remembrance of her until late that night. And then, and then it's like, I like met her again. Like, oh my goodness, like I have a baby. Oh, who is she? Like, I have no recollection. So that's that I have really, when I found that out, I really grieved it. Like, I bet that's traumatic. That's extremely traumatic. Yeah. That part. And even on top of it, having your placenta pulled out, that's traumatic. Yes. No. And that yeah. I like, I feel like because they had already shot Pitocin in, that was already kind of like a blank. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Like I knew they did it. Yeah. Yeah. But like, yeah. I don't think I felt the trauma of it as much because they'd already sure. put it in. And I was already like, okay, well. I don't know what happened to me and you know, now I'm gone. So yeah, Pitocin no. is, is so detrimental. I mean, it, it literally can cause hemorrhage. We're, we're, we're using it to like prevent hemorrhage, but like, it I hear so many women it. say I have to get Pitocin because otherwise I hemorrhage. And it's like, how do you know if you always get it? You know, how do you know? And if you have a disturbed birth, I'm not even shocked that you hemorrhaged because anything you've done to your birth you've disturbed the oxytocin. And when you disturb the oxytocin, then your uterus is not going to do what it's supposed to do. And yep. the other things that disturb birth are anything that introduce adrenaline into your body. So fight, flight, you know, fear, all of that, that's adrenaline. So the, the hospital is just saturated with that. That's all there is, right? Yeah. There's no calm, cool, like at peace. No, not at all. So of course yep. your oxytocin was blocked because it'll be blocked mm-hmm. by adrenaline or it'll be bo- blocked by pitocin. So it breaks my heart when I hear moms that are planning hospital births and they have this whole plan, you know, I'm going to go in, everything's going to be natural. I'm hearing what you're saying. You knew these things and they still found ways to go against what you would have agreed to if they had simply stopped for a second to say, is it okay if we give this to you? And you would have said no. And they did it anyway. And that's, I think why you and I are so passionate about home birth is because we don't want to fight when we're in labor. We don't want to fight. We just want to do our thing, do what our bodies know that they are capable of doing. Yeah, it's a hundred percent right. I mean, birth was not designed for a fight. It was not. I mean, it was literally Mm -hmm. the grace of God that this labor happened the way it did, right? Like so many other scenarios could have could have happened that would have played out just very detrimentally and I really feel like his hand was in it like he did protect me and enabled this this to happen and I had really submitted this to him too like God I know I can like I know I can give birth vaginally and Mm -hmm. I fully trusted my body then like like, without without a doubt and they're like well you don't have a proven pelvis you're a first time mom I was like I don't even know what that means but like (laughs) you don't have a proven pelvis you don't have a proven pelvis yeah that's 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 what they tell women who haven't had a baby yet um they'll that's tell them insane. they don't have a proven pelvis. yeah yeah uh, we, I, I did did god not re- create us with a, pro- a proven pelvis I was like, look at these hips i'm fine <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm you know it's uh, funny that you say that because when i had my first i had an OBGYN and the whole hospital shenagel thing you know and yeah. i remember her saying oh you're uterus is tilted like this and that and she was trying to path- pathologize me And then afterwards, when I went for my six week checkup or whatever, and I was crying because of my horrible experience, she was like, you know, I could tell when I felt in there before you had the baby that you were going to have problems. What? And I'm like, okay, lady. I literally knew she was full of it. You know, of course, went on to naturally birth my own babies without any of this nonsense. (laughs) But like, that's the kind of stuff that they make up. I mean, anyway. It's exactly what they do. They live, I mean, they tell women anything. You would not believe some of the things that women have told me in birth coaching and like birth trauma debriefs. 
Yeah. Tell me, so tell me about your, your birth. What, what is your, um, you go by a birth keeper. Is that your title or? Yeah. So you have to use the term birth keeper because the word midwife is owned legally. So you can't say midwife unless you are licensed. So, and if you're licensed, you're tied to the laws of the hospital in your state. You are, you have you have to do certain things in a certain way, carry Pitocin, all that. I think that that's what a lot of women don't understand about home birth midwives is you're getting the same hospital midwife experience. Oftentimes they're not, everybody's the same. There are some good ones out there, but on honestly, the majority, the ones that are in my area, unfortunately, I mean, they might as well be a hospital midwife with, they send you to the hospital to, to, get and checked they have, for things they have to stay in good relations with the hospital so they it's very important that they do things a certain way because then if they transfer you like it's yeah it, it's a relationship so they are jay they're uh, the obstetric system truly and there are some good ones and but what you'll find is that the good ones they have to lie on their documentation so they may they may like really look out for the woman. They may say that her, her last cycle was, was a different date when it really, when it really was, or they may say that they did X amount of cervical checks when they didn't. Um, they may do that. But for me, I could never do that. I couldn't live that. I, I have to live in integrity. I am an yeah. honest person and mm-hmm. I cannot, I cannot, abide, I cannot live. I would not sleep at night if I had, like, I'm not going to lie to a woman. And I'm mm-hmm. not going to lie to somebody else either. Yep. So yep. it puts them out of integrity because they have to always be manipulating one or the other. Like, do I manipulate the woman? Do I manipulate my documentation? Which do mm-hmm. I ma- manipulate? And that was, a, I mean, that was a very clear choice to me that I will, I will, I'm not going to do either of those. So that's a good, um, that's probably, a really good point. Yeah, that's a good point, especially on timing, right? Because midwives, I know the mid licensed midwives here, they have to carry you out, carry you out, meaning send you back to the hospital if you're 42 weeks. The average pregnancy right. is 40, 41.5 weeks. So yeah. most women, they come up to that cusp, they start freaking out, which means you're tense. You're not going to go into labor because you're freaking out. And then you go to yep. that 42 weeks and potentially over, or you don't even make it to then because your midwife is freaking out because she has to, you know, do her paperwork to the state or whatever. And I see that happen a lot. And well, it- and what midwives do is they start pushing all of the natural induction, which is not, there's nothing natural about it. So they're going to- Induction is induction, them. right? It doesn't matter what it is. If yep. it's Membrane natural. Membrane sweep, natural oil, they're going to start pushing that. Because they're going to mm-hmm. be like, well, we can get your labor started. And so mm-hmm. women have these dramatic, horrible labors because they did these things that their midwife coerced them to do simply because their midwife couldn't be there past 42 weeks. That's just Can, sick. can you sick. tell us a little bit about some of these? You mentioned membrane sweeps. I know midwives brew is another one. Um, can yeah. you tell us a little bit about a membrane sweep, why it is potentially dangerous to your physiological birth. Why is that a bad idea? Yeah. Well, first of all, you're putting somebody else's finger, um, up into your cervix. So you're literally going through the cervix and then like breaking the, so like, this is your cervix, like going up and like breaking the, the amniotic sac, the bag of waters from around inside of the uterus, right? You're separating that. Well, women, they have their cervix torn with midwives, nails or fingers um they introduce foreign bacteria like our own microbiome and the and the environment our microbiome of our family that is safe it's safe you can have sex whenever you want in pregnancy you can check your own cervix because you know what your body knows it's you but it doesn't matter how many blue gloves you want to put on that's you can't ever be sterile and that's foreign and the thing about our, our body, and I believe our cervix especially, is that it reacts to safety or not being safe mm. because it will close if it is not safe. Our cervix mm-hmm. will close right now. It is not safe. Nothing's coming out. Nothing's going in. And that's a preventative measure I believe God has given us. But that, that right there starts a, a reaction, I think, in women's bodies, especially that's like, no, 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 no. Like, what just went inside of me? This shouldn't be inside of me. But there's so many other things that can happen. So if you break the bag of waters early, 
for one thing, labor probably might not be ready to start at all. So now we have open waters and we've introduced foreign microbiome, bacteria, whatever you want to call it. And that is a breeding ground for actually having a problem. That's why they're like, well, you have to give birth in so many hours because risk of infection. Well, if they hadn't stuck their fingers up inside of you, you would have been fine. Your, your mm -hmm. waters could have been open for a month. You would have been fine. But mm -hmm. because we've gone and put our fingers inside of a woman, that's a problem. Um, but also there's the risk of core prolapse because the baby hasn't engaged. It's not ready to come out yet. And so there's a swoosh of waters. If they break the water and then that's when a cord can often fall out. And that's a true emergency. Now we actually have to do a C-section. So that is one of the true emergencies in birth. There's not very yep. many, but like that. No, there's not. Yeah. But that's one of them. And that one and it's can lead to the next. Yeah. Yeah. So that is one they want to do. Yeah. Breaking your waters, a membrane sweep, castor oil, or yeah, midwives brew their, their little concoction, um, <laughs> all the black cohosh and blue cohosh. And, and they, all of those come with like massive risks. I have an entire post on this. Like they're all fraught with, with risk. I mean, castor oil is, uh, is by far like my, like I am vehemently, like I hate it so much. I love castor oil <laughs> on my skin, but like consume. It is so toxic and the births and the labors that it gives women are atrocious. And I, yeah, I can anyway. only imagine, I can only imagine. So we had Dr. Vaughn on the podcast last year and he is a naturopath doctor and iridologist and he uses castor oil for stomach bugs because it literally empties your body. So yes. I can't imagine using that when you're in labor. I mean, you must, it, that must not feel good at all to no, have no, diarrhea no. and feel sick. And they have the most painful labors, painful contractions. Because first of all, they've depleted their body of all their minerals. And our minerals are what are, allow our smooth muscles to contract in a rhythmic, smooth, beautiful, fluid way. Our heart, our uterus, right? Those are the two crucial ones actually in, in labor. And mm -hmm. it depletes them of their minerals, our, our muscles. So now women are totally fatigued. They're mineral depleted. So their contractions are so strong because they're, they don't have enough minerals in their body. They're wow. dehydrated. I mean, what a horrible state to enter labor in sick to their stomach. Yes. They don't want to be. So they have these horrible long labors. I, they, they hemorrhage and things like that. Cause castor oil can cause that as well. Their baby poops as well. So now we've got meconium, which meconium is not actually an issue, but in that case, like it wasn't needed. And now mm -hmm. they're transferring because of meconium. It, it's just like, it's like, what a great way to really like, honestly, like poop all over your labor, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. That doesn't sound fun to me at all. And I think the thing that's so interesting about it, cause we're talking about even quote natural, right? We're not even talking about the stuff, the crazy stuff they do in the hospital, like give you Cervidil right. and pump those little balloons up there and all, all those nuts. So things that I mean, I think they're not. So yeah. we're just talking about the more naturally minded things. And even yeah. that it just, you know, it brings us back to this conversation about God's design for birth and how we as humans just want to control everything, right? We just want to be in control and like this baby needs to come out now because I'm tired or I don't feel like doing this anymore, or it's Christmas tomorrow and I don't want to have this baby on Christmas or whatever it might be, whatever the reasons are that we come up in our own, own heads. And listen, I'm talking about myself here too. So I hope no one listening thinks that I am being judgmental when I was pregnant with my first and I got, she was due on New Year's day on oh. January 1st. And so I'm going into Christmas week, like, all right, come out now. Yeah. And I was trying some of this nonsense, like, you know, bouncing on my ball and doing the curb stepping and all that, you know, I was trying to do at home stuff, eating eggplant, Parmesan, the same recipe, no, from, you know, yeah. that, that silly stuff. But then I did use my breast pump and that did put me into labor. Yeah. And I kind of wish that it, I hadn't done that because my baby was, she was OP, she was asynclitic. Like I, she wasn't ready. There was a reason why labor wasn't starting. Yeah. She wasn't in, you know, she, not, not to say that babies need to be in any position, right? Because you could be breached. You could be OP. You could be anything. The baby's going to come out. Yeah. I guess I just feel like I was forcing something to happen that I should have just waited patiently for her yeah. to arrive. And I regret that. And so I think yeah. it's, it's why I'm speaking from this context to say, yeah. 
we want to control things. I wanted to control the situation. And the truth is if I had just let go and surrendered, you know, would have been different, but lesson learned, right? (laughs) Yeah. And, and what if God knows better? Like that's, Uh, yeah. Oh wait, actually he does. He (laughs) actually knows better. We can, man, maybe men didn't make their plans, but God has a last word. And I'm telling you like his plan for your birth is a million times better than whatever you've crafted and whatever you want to make happen because you are, you are then you're missing out on his plan. And Mm -hmm. I'm, and I'm going to promise you, like, it's the better plan. And I think absolutely like the surrender and trust that is necessary in birth. If we're going to, if we're going to leave it alone and let it happen the way it's supposed to happen like that, I think that actually follow us, follows us then into motherhood. I think Mm -hmm. the really good way to like, Ooh, put all these things into like the hard work of like, Oh, I have to trust. I have to surrender in pregnancy and waiting for labor. Like what a beautiful time to be practicing these things because you know what? The motherhood is just a trust and surrender journey start to finish. Like you can think you're going to make your kids do this. You can think this is going to happen. You can think whatever you want. And you start to realize pretty soon, like these are God's children. And, and I, like, I can do everything I want and they're still God's children and I have to trust them to him. And so I just think we're actually like, missing out on this beautiful lesson that is there for us when we try to take it into our own hands. That's so beautiful. I, I totally agree with you. It, that, that is the correlation there is perfect. I want to ask you too, because I know that you have many clients that you've worked with on their births. Can you tell me a little bit more about how you've seen God in those experiences, either with your clients or in your own experiences with birth? It's really, I mean, for me, with what I know from the medical system, it's really beautiful to see a birth play out and to be able to like reflect back on, it's going to probably make me cry, on all the things that would have gone wrong had they been in the hospital. Mm. Um, Because it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart, like even thinking about that that possibility of these like precious mothers and their precious babies. um, Because I can, I can see it all. Like I know you know, that, that the baby was breached. I know that there was meconium. I know the baby didn't actually take a breath or cry for four minutes. I know that, um, you know, th- things didn't happen the way they are supposed to in mm-hmm. the medical world. And still we have this like beautiful birth and there was, and everything was totally fine. And mom is doing well and the babies are doing well. And so sometimes with my husband, I will like go through, I, like list out, like, this is like, these are all the things that wouldn't have been okay in a medical establishment. And mm-hmm. they were perfectly okay. They were yeah. beautiful. There wasn't a problem in the world. And so, um, and I don't, and, and the mothers sometimes don't even see them because they don't care. They don't care. They, I mean, they're in it. That's, that's me from the outside perspective, watching it. Like women know if their babies are okay. So they're not there. And I'm not concerned either, but I can just see it from that perspective as well like oh my goodness like that would have been an issue and I don't I don't actually see it in the moment but it's when I like replay it in my head afterwards and think wow (laughs) it's a good thing we chose this route you chose this route because it would have been so pathologized um because birth doesn't fit into a box and and we think it it does um yeah it's I I totally agree with that yeah and I, I saw that in my sister's birth too she recently about seven, eight months ago, had a VBAC after two C-sections at a birthing center and baby was asynclitic, took a, just took a little while to come down. And it was her first, vag- obviously vaginal birth because she had two C-sections. And afterwards she said to me, and I think she said it on her episode, she shared her birth story. If I had been in a hospital, I would have had another C-section. They never would have yeah. let me labor for that long. No. Mm-mm. And it, so you're absolutely right. And it was crazy for us to see it play out Yeah, that she was outside of the system and the baby was born and I was in the system for my first kind of same positioning situation. Right. And they're like, no, we got to give up. Let's move you into the OR. I, I love how they call it an emergency C-section. Like there's actually an emergency. There's not. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Where's the emergency? <laughs> I'm pushing and you came in here and told me I have to go do this. What What is going, what do you mean there's an emergency? Exactly right. there's, yeah. <laughs> so the word 
the phrases that are used that are just, um, they're just fear mongering terms. Um, and you just kind of have to like peel back the layers to what women are told, you know, even as I like tell their story, I'm like, well, okay. <laughs> These words sound big and like, like scary, but like, let's like sure. peel it back. <laughs> yeah. 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 Exactly. What are some of the misconceptions that you see when it comes to birth that are just so backwards in the medical paradigm and that you want women to really know and take out of this episode about birth yeah. and their bodies? Um, I feel like one of the biggest things is just that when birth is disturbed, it doesn't work. We wouldn't disturb any other animal in birth. We know that will mess up their birth. Scoop and up yeah, that cat, take it to the vet. <laughs> yes, I remember my sister telling me she had her cats. It was about the time I was giving, I was giving birth to my last baby and her birth, her cat was pregnant and she kept trying to like make a home for her cat like a, like a little nest like a nice place and she was so excited that her cat was having kittens she's 10 years older than me older than me but she's oh she's she's just amazing she's the sweetest lady anyways and so she's like telling me like she's trying to like create this home for this cat to give birth in and she's like feeling very like mothering towards her and like just want to be there to support her like she's being a little cat midwife no no the cat like finds like the like the whole you know, away from everything and trash doesn't even matter. Like the <laughs> the cat escapes. Gets birth. Yeah. Because yeah. that's what it's supposed to do. Yes. And like we do the same thing. If you will observe a woman in labor, you will watch her. You will watch her. She will be in her living room. And now she's in her bedroom. Mm. And now she's gone back to the bathroom and she's mm. closed the door. Oh, wow. Like as if she actually knows that's what she's supposed to do. She didn't plan it that way but you'll just watch her kind of like pull out of, of the, the group that may be there or just her family that's there and like become a little recluse and go back. And maybe her husband goes with her, but that's what we want to do. It's, it's ingrained in us. We need quiet. It's instinct. We need dark. Yes. We need to be undisturbed and unobserved. And the moment you, you disturb birth, which is actually possible to not to, to not disturb it in a hospital, um, mm -hmm. the moment you do that, you, it starts to erode and there's lots of ways it can erode, but it starts to erode. And so women who have like long labors and they tell me about their long labor, but they also like drove back and forth to the birth center several times, or they did this or they, they did that, or the, you know, parents came over and saw them. Blah, blah. I'm like, well, of course, of course you have a long labor. <laughs> like, are you kidding? Me? Like how many disturbances did you have? And so labor stops stops, labor starts, labor stops, labor starts, it's not safe. And so um, how are, I mean, just for women to think about like, how am I least disturbed? And what disturbs me? Like, is a, mid, is a midwife going to disturb you? And if you are mid, with your midwife, like be very aware of her presence and, and how she carries herself. And do you feel comfortable with her? Because we can like somebody. We're like, yeah, you're a cool person. You're crunchy. Like I'm crunchy. It doesn't mean we like their presence feels safe to us and we feel like loved and held and like we can be vulnerable. That's a different feeling. Mm -hmm. And so really knowing how that energy, even between if somebody's going to be there at your birth, um, but then even thinking like, is that going to disturb it? I mean, I have women that I work with that like halfway through prenatal sessions, they're like, well, what if I just free birth? I'm like, <laughs> beautiful, do it. Yeah. 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 You can do it. This is a horrible business plan and you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> and that, but that's the beauty of you and what you do is that <gasps> it's not even about, it's not about that for you, for you. This is your passion. This is, you want to see women. I just chuckle about it. Cause I'm like, this is funny. Like, I'm like, yeah, totally. I, I get it. I get it. I get it. <laughs> they, have come, they have started to realize like, as we talk, like, oh, we, we could do this ourselves. I'm like, mm -hmm. we really like you, but like, I think I'd feel safer without you there. Like, that's great. Of course you do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm not in the room when you have sex. Of course yeah. you feel safe. Yeah. I'm not there. Yeah. So, and I feel like women just don't understand that. They don't understand that it needs to be that safe and that protected. And like for your children, the thing is, we also on the, on the opposite side, I think we can fear that we will act. So if you are aware of that, you fear like you're actually, actually going to accidentally disturb it and I have found that in a home where they're like you're used to having your children around and they're yelling and screaming that's so normal that's that's normal interaction right that's mm -hmm. not disturbing us um I mean we talk about like babies are born 
in the same environment that they're made. Mm -hmm. And if you have a home with lots of little kids, you probably have your kids outside making a racket while you're trying to have sex, right? <laughs> like that's the way babies are made. So if if really you have a bunch of kids, I love those questions, yeah. right? When people are like, oh, you have a lot of little kids or you co-sleep. Like, I don't understand how this even happens. And it's like, really? <laughs> really? Pretty easy. You lock your door. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It's, it's, Get I creative. Know, we this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. You do know this happens other times a day, right? Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But like, that's not disturbance, right? Because we talk about like, if you can, can you poop around this person? Would you have sex? Like, would you have sex in this environment? Because those are the, those are the things we need to feel safe doing. Wait, well, wait, 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 wait. Have you ever not pooped with your children present? <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, they're I, always in the bathroom. Hi, <laughs> please Staring come in at because you. honestly, like, yeah, I need you to come in so I can feel more comfortable. Thank you with your <laughs> exactly. eyes. Exactly. <laughs> I feel lonely yeah. right now. You're not here watching me. <laughs> exactly right. So like, you're not going to disturb it in your own home, but if you invite an outsider or your mother who always there or a best friend who isn't always there that can start to disturb it it really can so we don't need to be so worried that we're like oh my, you know my what if my kids come in well you're used to them coming in like that's that's the normalcy of our life and and birth fits very well into that but it doesn't fit well into outsiders it doesn't fit well into um going to strange environments yeah that'd be that'd be a major one people need to like let that soak mm -hmm. in Absolutely. It's, I was like getting goosebumps when you said that because I follow the exact same model birthing at home. I start in the living room and then I make my way upstairs and then I'm, you know, in my, in the closet. I like our, our we have like a little birth closet, I call it. Mm -hmm. And then I end up in the bathroom and then the baby's born. It's, it is, it's this process, but I like to be minimal, you know, alone. That's just how it feels. And I thought actually going into my third birth that I might want my kids to be present for the birth part of it. Yeah. But as I got closer, I was like, no, 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 I still want to be by myself. I'm not ready. But they were little, you know, right. little, little. So, and, and there's no, no, nothing wrong with saying like, I don't want my kids there. I'm just saying like, if they're there. For no, people, totally. Like, they were in the house and they were in the house right? the whole time. And yeah. then as I got right, when it got to the end, my mom dropped them with our friend, our neighbor, so that she could be present. Cause my mom was there for my first home birth and then the second one. And I feel comfortable with my mom there. You know, she's I'm on comfortable. Campus. She's comfortable for me, but yeah. I do, I do sometimes think as my daughter gets older, I want her to be a part of that because she's so, she loves birth. She loves pregnancy. She's into it. Kind of it reminds me of you, know, you were reading your mom's books when you were a little kid. That's how my daughter is. You know, she's like, mommy, I want to be put this ball in my tummy. Cause I want to look like you. And I it's just it. the sweetest thing. It's so cute. So my, I know my, at some point now that she's a little older. Yeah. I have an almost 10 year old and like she, I would, I would easily, if the right birth came along, I would easily take her to a birth because she would be actually the best birth attendant, the best, because she has zero fear. She has zero indoctrination, right? Yes. She's only known conversations of birth mm -hmm. and she's so trusting and like, she'll, she'll watch birth videos with me and she can pick apart what went wrong just as well as I can. And I love I that. Her, oh my gosh. You could, you could actually start doing this work as a very young woman because mm -hmm. like it, it's in you. And I, and I see that in her and she loves it. And so, I mean, like, yeah, I come home from a birth and I'm like, did you bring pictures of the placenta? Cause usually that, you know, <laughs> like that's why I have pictures up because all the other birth photos somebody else took, but like, I always take, I'll take a picture of the placenta. Um, like it's exciting for my kids and especially for her, like she just soaks it all up. And mm -hmm. that's what midwifery used to be. It used to be passed along and older women would teach younger women. And it was just, you just, you just learned the, these things. And then that was taken from us like three, four generations ago. Mm -hmm. And here we yeah, are. when they started yeah. putting women under her to have babies, like, okay. You know, you brought up a good point though with children. I think that there is a misconception around children in birth too, that they'll be scared, that they can't handle it, that, you know, there's, it's just not the place for children. But if we don't, if we, meaning those of us that are having physiological births truly are not teaching yeah. our children about real birth, then what's the yeah. alternative? 
they're going to be taught babies are born in the hospital, get the medications, get induced, schedule the C-section. You know, they're just, they're following that medical paradigm. And I really think that it's breaking the mold by teaching children outside of it. Uh, my daughter was watching some, some show, I think it was like Peppa Pig and you know, the mommy rabbit or whatever it is goes to the hospital to have the babies or whatever. And so one day my, my daughter said something like that, you know, Oh, I got to go to the hospital. And I go, what are you going to the hospital for? She's like, I'm having my baby, you know, her pretend baby. Oh, why? We don't go to the hospital to have a baby. And she goes, Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, it was like, I love it. The yeah. world is trying to pull one way it and is. we have to be strong as mothers in, you know, yeah. in all in the knowledge of God's design for us to say, yes. yeah, I know that that's what the world is going to tell you, but it's false. Yeah. yeah. I would, okay, then this probably maybe, maybe sounds radical, but like I would go as far to say that it is, if birth had stayed in the home, like it is the teacher for all sexuality. Hmm. And when it has been removed, since it has been removed from the home, we have lost touch of sexuality, right? Women That's are sexualized, yeah. breasts, vulvas, mm -hmm. it's all been sexualized. And when you put birth in the home, we start to understand why a woman is designed, designed the way she is and mm -hmm. what the purpose is and how how special and treasured these parts of her body are and the deep sacredness of them. And so now we treat them sacredly. I mean, my kids, they like they understand how sacred birth is and how sacred it is to grow a baby. I mean, and and, and it's so sacred. And so I I think if if children had that growing up, then, then women, women are no longer sexualized and we don't have this, this, you know, uh, confusion about whether we're a male or a female and all of these things. I mean, we're everywhere the world is today mm -hmm. that I think, um, yeah, this is one part of this is that birth has been taken out of the home yeah, and that's where it belongs. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I believe that very strongly. It teaches sexuality. That's a really good point. I hadn't thought about it from that perspective, but you're absolutely right. And I think that that's actually part of the continued medical model is yeah. you go in, it's a procedure type of situation. And then after what happens when you're in that culture, bounce back culture, yep. you got to get your, get your body back, get back to who you exactly. were before, even though you'll never be the same and you're not the same. And it's <laughs> yeah. back, right? Go, you got to get back to being sexy again. And it's so sad. It's like, so why sad. can't we just be in the body? God yeah. gave us our bodies to change and to evolve, not to force it to be what it once was, not to force it back into that maidenhood time. You know, we were young and whatever we were when we were 19, 20 years old, you yeah. grow into a woman, you become a yeah. woman and you get you know, you go through this experience of coming into motherhood. We're not supposed to be that person anymore. We're different no. now. We're, we're reborn along with our babies in a way, you know, it's. Yeah. And why do we make those things so negative? Why are we soft? Because our baby needs to lay on our soft tummy. Yeah. And our kids need to lean against our soft body. Like, of course we're soft. There'll be a time to, to not maybe be that way. Like, and our kids will grow up and, and our body will go back a little bit more to what it was before but like mm -hmm. this is the way god designed it to be Absolutely. you're supposed to be soft and mushy after your baby's born you're really soft and mushy and that's exactly the environment that a baby needs to lay on like yep. come on just be a little bit aware of of how perfect this design is i mean is my thinking like how ideal how ideal that our hips actually get wider after birth and they're never going back to their maiden hips. They're not yep. because we really have children to carry on them. I mean, for me, oh, all the things about God's design, they make me emotional. Cause I'm just like, how perfect God, this is so stinking amazing. It like, is. That's what, that's what it does. If we will just embrace it and mm -hmm. just, just get rid of what the world says. Like just be willing to like soak in the beauty of how God has designed it. Amen. Yeah. It's, Choosing not to believe what the world says about our bodies, but to really follow his design. Cause you're right. We become soft and squishy for that baby. You know, yeah. some mine still is, I have a six month old and so I've got that squishy, 
tummy and yeah. my son who's 22 months, he loves to pull my shirt up and he, he squishes on my belly. He'll lay on it. He'll kiss it. And you know, what if I had a different opinion about that and myself, how sad would that be to like pull it away and be like, Oh, don't do that. It's, you know, it's, I, it's not how I want it to be. Instead. I'm like, yes, that's how my body is. And, you know, I have to teach my daughter the same thing. Cause she's old enough to ask the questions like, why do you still look pregnant? Yeah. And I explained to her, you know, yeah. because this is how God designed my body that yeah. it's supposed to still be soft and my uterus is getting smaller. And this is how it, this is how you look. I, I like to say this to her. This is how you look after you have a baby. And one day you'll look like this too. Hold, I love that answer. And so in a positive much. way, not in a like negative way. You yeah. Know? Yeah. You're, you'll oh. have this too one day. You'll get to be big like mommy, you know, like grown up. <laughs> This is, this is it. Like, this is, this is a goal. This isn't a negative. It should be celebrated. It should right? totally be celebrated. I agree a thousand percent. Yes. <sighs> well, we have so much more to explore and I'm so excited to continue to dive in with you on our episode next week. Is there anything that you wanted to close us with today? I would just say to any of the women out there, wherever you possibly are in your pregnancy journey, if anything that I have said or you have said resonates with you and you don't feel like you're in the right place to be giving birth, you can change at any time. Whether you are 40 weeks, whether you are 14 weeks, you can change and you can go a different route and you don't have to follow through with something. I have so often heard women's stories and they follow through with a birth that they knew was going to turn out poorly based on the place or the person that they were working with. Mm -hmm. And I just want to tell, I just want to tell you, you can, you can stop now. You can make a different choice and you admit, you may be forever grateful that you did. And so, um, yeah, I just want to leave them with that. Awesome. Thank you so much. This was awesome talking. I can't wait to continue this conversation. A reminder to those listening that you can find Audrey on Instagram at a joyful birth or on her website, a joyful birth.org. And thank you so much for tuning in and for being on this journey with us. If you'd like to follow along outside the podcast, join the mission on Instagram at The Radiant Mission or on Facebook at The Radiant Mission Podcast. And if you're not already watching the podcast, be sure to check it out on YouTube, visit The Radiant Mission, or you can search my name, Rebecca Toomey, T-W-O-M-E-Y is how my last name is spelled. And today we are going to close with 1 Thessalonians 5.24. This is actually a verse that Audrey shared with me that she feels continues to play out over and over in her life that God is always faithful. And when she's obedient to what he calls you calls her to, it becomes a reality. And that verse is he who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Thank you so much for listening and we're wishing you a radiant week. We'll see you next time.